Welcome to JCT TV, interview and Bible teaching for the 21st century. I don't know about you, friends, but I'm really enjoying these interviews I'm doing with my oldest son, Todd. Um, we've got a couple, you know, behind us. We got one today and one next week. Um, he's a very interesting guy. He's a pastor. He's a TV producer. He's an author. Uh, he's a father of four, uh, but he has a very interesting perspective as a young pastor, especially as someone who grew up in Jerusalem, Israel. So my interview with, with Todd continues, and then our Bible study. Hang in there with us. Jim Kennel on Today is a program dedicated to the teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. This all through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. JCT also brings to you encouraging testimonies and stories from Christian leaders all over the globe. If this program has added value to your life, would you please consider becoming a partner? To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. As I said off the top, Todd Catalan, my eldest son, is uh, my guest. He's a pastor, he's a uh, TV producer, he's an author. Speaking of authoring, Todd, <laughs> you, you, ju you just finished a novel. I did. Well, I finished the book. I'm still finishing the novel. So I've been writing two How's this that work? You finished the book, not the novel. What do you mean? Well, it's the book that I finished is not a novel. It's oh. a Christian book, right? It's a Christian living book. Oh. And then the novel, which is called Eden, I'm still finishing. Oh. So I finished Joyful Misfits, which is the Christian book, and then I'm finishing Eden. Okay, so there you go. It took, took me to get to the studio to, to learn that about yeah. you. So I, did, I, I didn't realize books. I, I didn't realize were two books. Yeah. Well... You're just as bad as me. I, I just finished Matthew and Mark, and now I'm doing Luke Acts. Yeah, it's funny. It's like we're playing ping pong. You post a picture of finishing something, I post a picture of finishing something. <laughs> uh, I want to get into, you know, pastoring in 2019. Sure. Um, but just, uh, uh, just a few more questions about your upbringing and experiences in mm -hmm. Israel, mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Uh, you used to go to Gymnasia. That was the name of the high school, mm -hmm. you and Jess, on bus 18. Right. We lived at that time in uh, the German colony. Mm -hmm. We had moved from Mojave. And so it was about a, what, 10 minute ride by bus to Gymnasia? Yeah, depending on the traffic. Depending on the traffic. Mm -hmm. One day your bus blew up. Yeah, like, do you remember how many stops south of our It was, it was just two stops south two of stops. us. Two stops. I've told the story many times, but I don't remember how many stops. It was stops. Two, two stops. We, I, I heard the sound. No way. Yeah. Really? But you weren't there. No, I'd gotten off. <laughs> It is crazy. You know, as, as an Israeli kid, they teach you to always watch out for uh, what they call a chifetz chashud, a, a, a suspicious object. And so, you know, you're always watching for, even to this day, you know, you can't set a bag down in Israel no. and, and have it stay there. But, uh, yeah, it just goes to show you, right? You never know. Life is a tenuous, fragile thing. You may or may not remember that the day after the, your bus blew up, we put you on bus 18. I remember. I remember. And why did we do that? Because you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't happen today, let me tell you. Well, I'll tell you. You'd be driving me to school. Our, our, <laughs> our view was if, if our boys don't get on the bus, the terrorists win. Yeah, I mean, it's a very Israeli attitude. Yeah. I mean, that's Israeli. And also, I mean, I can appreciate knowing what I know now about Israeli culture. Mm. I can appreciate the, I mean, don't call it peer pressure, but definitely the, you're not gonna, you're not gonna look like the lame Western parents to your Jewish neighbors and say, oh wow, we're gonna drive our son. So that's the right decision. So I just walked down to the same Makolet, got my, bought my same uh, bagel and Makolet, chocolate. local, uh, local gro yeah, uh, corner store. Corner store, yeah. yeah. I bought my same shokovelachmania, my same piece of bread and chocolate milk and got on the bus. And, yeah, and I remember being aware, like, all right, that happened yesterday, this, mm. this could happen. But you know, what are you gonna do? If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. If it's not, it's gonna not. It's not, I'm not gonna worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, as Jesus said, think not what tomorrow bringeth sufficient of the days evil thereof. In other words, don't borrow trouble from the future. Definitely an Israeli perspective. Very <laughs> Well, I could keep talking about Israel. I'm sure our viewers would love me to keep talking with you about Israel, and it may yet come up. We've got today and the, we, we got the ne next week as well. Sure. You've been a pastor for a number of years. Mm -hmm. You actually 
started preaching when you were still a teenager. Yeah, I 19, I think I started preaching regularly. And you uh, used to host um, my Friday night uh, talk to me show yeah. on Friday nights yeah. as a 19 year old. You've been doing TV your whole life. Uh, you've been immersed in the scriptures pretty much your whole life. Now you're pastoring this thriving church. Um, what is pastoring teaching you about you? Huh. I mean, I wouldn't say it's teaching me anything I don't know already, but it's forcing me to walk in those things that I do know. So, for example, I know about the power of brokenness and humility, but when you're pastoring, it forces you to, week in and week out, really do that, or else you become, you know, a caricature, a jerk, uh, one of these pastors that none of us want because to be. Because the fact is that you're, 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 you're speaking to, to several people in that congregation of, what, 300 now you have? Yeah, we're 400 now. You're close to 400. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, yeah. It's, you, it's growing like crazy. It's growing fast, yeah. It was about 125 when you started? 152 was the 10-week average Two years leading ago. up to the week they hired me. Yeah. But you're, you're speaking to people, many of whom are heroes just by being there. Sure. I mean, you taught me that, and, you know, my, my grandfathers and grandmothers, I remember, taught us this as well. But to never underestimate um, the weight that people bring with them into church. And it's not always doom and gloom. I'm always careful to say, look, if you're here today and you're in pain, this is the place for you. If you're here and you're ready to celebrate today, this is also the place for you. So I think the weight of, of uh, trouble that is so common to each of us, it really, you really feel that when you're pastoring week in and week out. You know, you really, and, and, and if you're a preaching pastor, that really drives your approach to the Bible, your approach to your time in the pulpit, in terms of being absolutely focused on one, yes, doing everything you can to bring God glory, but two, doing everything you can to bring people joy. What are your, what are your core values when it comes to preparing a sermon? Uh, what, what is consistently there? Well, I never break form. I always prepare the same way. Mm -hmm. So, and I've been doing that since I was 19. Right. So I do certain things Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday that I always do, no matter what, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what time of day, like say something happens or whatever, I, I never break form. So I write in exactly the same way every time. Um, I, uh, so to tease that out a little bit, mm -hmm. for example, I always have to know what it's about by Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So if I know what it's about on Tuesday, well, good, that, that pressure is gone. But I will not go to sleep on Wednesday until I know what it's about. As I mentioned in a previous, uh, previous week, Thursday is language day. So I, always, so I never break form. Um, I always just preach through the text. So I'm not ever preaching topically. I'm mm -hmm. not ever you know, coming up with a short series. I'm just going to preach through the book. So right now in, at Grace, I'm not preaching verse for verse, but I'll do broad surveys. So when we finish this year in Patriarch, we'll go to Mark, and I'll preach all of the Gospel of Mark. Um, so it'll be 16 weeks. So I always just preach the text. Um, something that I always do, for example, I never decide, I never start writing until I know the ending. So, you know, and I know the ending from studying the text. And so when I know how it ends, then I decide how it begins. Um, I don't decide how it begins until I know how it ends. And so I'm not laying over, a, you know, my experience or an anecdote from my life. Uh, if I do have something from my life that connects to the way it starts, Great, and then the third step is I always, so I know how it ends, now I decide how it starts, but I always start it in a way that will connect directly to the text. So if I'm gonna start with a story or start with an illustration or start with you know, whatever I'm gonna start with, it one, has to grab people's attention and two, has to lead seamlessly into the text. Um, you know, if you study writing on any level, uh, the real artistry is in the transitions. So when people don't notice the transition, now you're a master. Uh, if you, you, you don't wanna say, and now let's move on to verse four. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fine to do that, but I prefer not to. I I want to be really great and so I want to try and do something spectacular which you know in, in terms of transitions I'm going to choose the most spectacular way to do it which is in a way that isn't noticed so you know all these types of things factor into it you know the thing I care most about is that when I come in the pulpit I can be unconscious I don't have to think about what I'm doing um, to me uh, I'm waiting for the thing to lift off uh, I'm waiting, I like to say, you know, am I in the third heaven or not? You know, to me, that's what really matters is that um, together, both myself with the Lord through the text and his people, that we have a holy moment, that, mm. that people feel. And this is what happens again and again and again in our churches, and I'm thankful to the Lord for it, and it's his work, not mine. Um, but people will come up and say, that was like you were preaching right to me. Mm. And so that's when I know it's really working, when people feel like um, this was a divine encounter for them through one of God's people preaching his word faithfully about Jesus. Uh, so those are some of the things that are top of mind for me. Hmm. Um, 
you face challenges uh, from a sociological perspective and a uh, social network cultural perspective that I never faced when I was your age. Mm. Uh, maybe it's too soon for us to really understand what may be happening to our people through social networking. Everything I'm reading by sociologists and observers is that even while we are so connected, we've never been so disconnected. Mm. I was shocked to read recently that a big study in the UK determined that one in four people say they have one good friend. Mm. Three out of four say, no, mm. I don't have a good friend. Mm. And they may have, you know, a thousand people who are following their mm. Instagram posts. Yeah. How do, you, how do you deal with that dislocation as a pastor? Well, I think it's the greatest opportunity the modern church has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Because in a church of any size, there, is, uh, there are a couple things on offer in an ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. One, an encounter with the living God in preaching and worship. Uh, and then, obviously, in the context of God's gathered people. Uh, and in those people, you see the body of Christ. You experience the life of God in a, in a tangible way. And so that kind of relational um, experience these days is almost non-existent. Yeah. You know, we used to say, you go to church, where, do, where can you get anything like preaching anymore? Well, that's been true now for dozens of years. That, that doesn't really happen. You have TED Talks, yes, but it's not the same as when a communicator stands up to preach the Bible. Uh, worship experience, you have rock concerts, yes, but it's not the same as when a worship service truly touches heaven. Um, now, in the relational context, where else do you gather with people amongst whom you are known? Uh, and who care for you and who will go the extra mile. And so one of the key distinctives at our church is uh, our care ministry is really phenomenal. And so people have this tremendous experience with God the Holy Spirit through preaching, teaching, and then they have this incredible relational experience with His people who actually care because they have been cared for in Christ. And so I think it's a wonderful opportunity. This study out of the UK made that point. They mm. said people do not have church. Yeah, Church used to be really the foundational um, social friendship factor yep. in, in the average person's life. Yep. I mean, maybe 100 years ago, maybe less than 100 years ago, everybody went to church. Yeah, sure. Well, when non-church people begin interacting with the church again, we have new people every week. So every week it's people who are there for the first time, every single week, um, which is often the case in a rapidly growing church. And they all say the same thing. Uh, Boy, I wish I'd come sooner. Yeah. I had no idea what I was missing. Uh, which is in one way very sad, because mm. our world, as you say, is mm. so, so isolated. But on the other hand, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be the love of Jesus to people in a very practical way. And what's really interesting about it is people haven't lost their ability to interact. You give them a context in which mm. they can begin to do life together, and all those muscles that have lain dormant for a while uh, spring back to life. Mm. A minute before we finish this interview, uh, when I've been to your church with your mom. I, we've been there a few times over the last few years. We're always blown away by a number of young couples and children. <laughs> yeah. you, you've got scores of children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, children are a priority for you. Well, hey, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. You know, mm. uh, when people awaken to new life in Christ, often procreation comes along with it. <laughs> it sounds like a cliche, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, when you emphasize it, you say, hey, look, we, we care. One thing that we do that's perhaps different than many churches is the kids are with us for the worship right. service. We don't send them away right away. We want them to learn to worship Jesus with us. So uh, that models something, I think, that is perhaps attractive. I grew up playing and with my crayons and coloring books and little toys on the floor of the church when I was a little guy looking up at these big people worshiping the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've always valued that for a child. Yeah. Todd Catalan's my guest. We have one more interview with him next week, and you'll want to watch it. We'll take a break, and I'll be back with my Bible study right after this. JCT TV is the official voice of WOW, working for orphans and widows. 
Jim Cantillon is the founder of WOW and has been ministering to orphans and widows in distress for 18 years. WOW's focus is home-based care for the dying. The horizon is vast, with thousands of the least of these in Africa and India. WOW depends on your generous support. To connect with us, you can call us at 1-800-969-9551, or you can visit us online at wowmission.com. So last week I spent uh, our whole teaching segment on verse 15, therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, th this is Jesus talking, he's, he's giving his uh, disciples some pointers as to the general contextual uh, realities that will surround, if you will, the end of days. Uh, Jesus looks at things with a long view, but he also understood intermediate, uh, if you will, incremental steps along the way. Only Jesus understood how long time would be. Um, and he doesn't reveal to us. In fact, he says at one point, don't try to set a date because he, right now he says only the Father knows. But uh, nevertheless, he's giving some general sort of ballpark indicators to the disciples as to what to expect before the end of days. So I, I'm not going to go back and talk about the abomination of desolation. Uh, if uh, you missed it, just log on to, um, you can just Google Jim Cantillon today and you can pick up. Another place is uh, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's uh, uh, the uh, marvelous uh, website by Bible Discovery that's hosted by Rod Hembry. Uh, you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and uh, when, when you come to the menu, hit on shows and you'll come to Jim Cantillon today and the very latest show will be the first one up on BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Okay? So if you missed last week, that's how to pick it up. So the sentence is really continuing here in verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But what are those who are pregnant to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or the Sabbath. Flee immediately. Now again, I, I mentioned last time Josephus' classic work, uh, The Wars of the Jews. Uh, he is the, really the only historian of that era that is quoted and is, you know, trustworthy. Um, he... Um, he describes things that will just, if you have any, curl your hair. I mean, I, when, I, when I read Josephus, I, I just have to gulp a lot because he doesn't, he doesn't uh, pull any punches. He tells you exactly how it was in Jerusalem shortly after Jesus' resurrection and the, the surrounding of Jerusalem by the Romans and the ultimate uh, victory of Titus over Jerusalem. Uh, it is um, gripping stuff, believe me. And all kinds of people over those years of siege were trying to escape. Most of them were killed by their own Jewish zealotry within Jerusalem itself as traitors before they got out through the walls. I mean, there was horror uh, within the walls of Jerusalem, Jew on Jew. Um, in many cases, merciless uh, horror. But uh, if, if they were able, he's saying, flee to the mountains. Uh, don't even spare a moment to get any clothing. Uh, don't uh, have any regard for the comforts of life. Just get out while you can get out. That's what Jesus is, is saying. Urgent escape. And of course, during the time of Titus, and this was the time probably Jesus was foreseeing, uh, that's exactly uh, what happened. Okay. Then there will be great tribulation, verse 21, such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. And I, I, again, I've got to stop here. Josephus says, as he describes the horrors of the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, he says this is the worst the world's ever known in history. He was talking about the abominable things that were going on, about the, 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 the desecration of the Holy of Holies and, and the, the temple. You know, really it was a, a kind of um, an abomination of desolation that unfortunately, in this case, was... Um, affected and superintended 
by the Jewish zealots who took over the temple, especially under one horrible man by the name of Simon. Uh, such as the world has not, uh, has not seen and has not been since the beginning of the world. No, and, and unless those days were shortened, verse 22, no flesh would be saved. Absolutely true. During the time of the siege. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Uh, false uh, messiahs, false prophets, always there are false messiahs and false prophets. You know, human ego knows no bounds. And uh, especially when you combine ego with uh, spiritual pride, it's a dynamite combination. And depending on the personality of the person who suddenly got this exalted view of themselves, they can convince a lot of people that they're the real deal. And history is rife with stories of uh, false messiahs and false prophets who have gathered thousands and tens of thousands of people around them to do this and do that, to, to do their bidding, in other words, to even kill themselves if uh, need be at the word of their leader. I remember in Guyana, the James Jones massacre of a few decades ago. I mean, you wonder, how does this happen? Well, it happens, friends, and it's happened throughout history, and Jesus foresaw it, and he said, this will happen again and again and again. Uh, these uh, movements are always linked to exclusive elitist occult knowledge that some leader purports to have. And uh, if someone, Jesus says, comes to you and says that the Messiah is out there, he's, he's in the wilderness, he's, he, or he's in here, he's hidden in the inner rooms, he's just waiting to be revealed, you know? He's, so get in on the secret. No. Jesus says, when I come again, it will be like a flash of lightning, which everybody will see. There's no need to say the Messiah is in the desert, or the Messiah is in that special place over there. Get in on the in crowd so that you can be a part of the messianic uh, victory. No, no. When I come again, Jesus says, everybody will not. All right. Verse 28. Let's go on. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes in the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Lightning illuminates everything. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. That's, that's uh, you know, very obscure. Well, it's an old proverb that, um, you know, his disciples would have understood its meaning. Basically, it means when the end comes, you'll know it. <laughs> the, the vultures arrive because the body's dead. So you're going to know the body's dead if you see the vultures. Basically, what he's saying is um, wh when, you, uh, when you see, you know, my return like a flash of lightning, you'll know that is the end and the beginning of the day of the Lord. Um, the, um, uh, nothing much more has to be said. But verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with glory, with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this is the real second coming that Jesus is talking about here. Um, coming on the clouds of heaven. When these things begin to take place, uh, Luke records it this way in chapter 21, verse 20, 28, look up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Um, you're not going to be, you're going to be caught by surprise in the one sense that suddenly it will happen when you don't expect it. But at the same time, it will be the beginning of a process. Uh, it will be the culmination of history and the beginning of the events that, uh, mark uh, not just the end of the age, but the coming of the kingdom of heaven and the beginning of the, of the heavenly kingdom. All right. So I want to comment on verse 31 for a minute. Elect. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four 
winds from one hand, end of heaven to the other. A lot of people don't like that, you know, and there's been whole doctrines built around it. John Calvin, you know, you've maybe heard of Calvinism. Uh, his Institutes of the Christian Religion became the basis for the doctrinal uh, core values of a lot of various church um, denominations as we know it now that had their genesis during the time of the Reformation. Um, you know what, I'm running out of time with this. Let me talk about the elect at the very top of our next teaching, okay? Because I don't want to give it less time than I should give it. Friends, as you know, Jim Cantillon has been offering Cantillon's casual commentary as a Bible study supplement to his ongoing exposition of St. Matthew's Gospel on JCT TV. He's excited to offer Volume 4, which completes the Matthew study. The Transfiguration, Triumphal Entry, Crucifixion, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ are all covered in this volume. Like the first three volumes, it's concise, captivating, and casual. To order your copy, you can call, write, or go online. Write to Jim Cantillon today, Post Office Box 989 Burlington, Ontario, L7R3Y7, or call us at 519-415-8341. You can also order online at jimcantillontoday.com. Request Cantillon's Casual Commentary Volume 4, and for a gift in any amount, it will be sent to you. When you place your order, also consider becoming a monthly partner. Remember, your gifts help us build this ministry. And I mean it, friends. Uh, next show, I'll pick up on the elect, okay? So... Sorry, I ran short on time, but next week I'll have as much time as I need. Catalyst Casual Commentary. This is all the book of Matthew here. It's in four tranches because it goes out nicely in an envelope and makes it cheaper for us to mail it to you. You know, economies of scale. This is a humble little program. But ask for it. And remember, your very best gift when you ask for it, will you? Uh, for, wow, working for Orphans and Widows because that's our parent body. We are JCT the spokesman for Working for Orphans and Widows, which my wife and I founded 19 years ago, and we still continue to work with great focus, uh, visiting orphans and widows in their distress in Sub-Saharan Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and now beginning in India as well. Uh, you can log on to wowmission.com, find out more about it, but we really appreciate your support, friends. Boy, without it, doesn't happen. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next time. Jim Cantillon, bye for now. Contact us, Jim Cantillon, today, P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 3Y7. If you're sending a check, make it payable to Jim Cantillon today. Or visit us online at jimcantillontoday.com and click support.